Good afternoon, everybody. The clock on my wall says three o'clock, so I'm going to start us off. I'm Mike Clossy, Director of Forestry with the Oregon Forest Resources Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the very first Tree School online webinar. We're going to be holding these every Tuesday from now until July 28th. There will be at 3 p.m. every day and on most days starting May 5th, most Tuesdays, there will also be at 10 a.m. So it's kind of exciting. Um, as you all know, because of the COVID-19, Tree School Clackamas on March 21st was canceled along with almost everything else. And so um, the folks from OSU Extension and OFRI and the Partnership for Forestry Education got together and we're bringing you this webinar series. And uh, right off the bat, I wanna thank the Oregon Department of Forestry and the US Forest Service for a grant that's helping pay for the, the out-of-pocket expenses to make this happen. So before we kick into Glenn, Glenn Aarons, our speaker for webinar number one, I have a few housekeeping things. So you all, except for four of us, are on as participants. And as of right this moment, there are 140 of you online. You may be able to see that, which isn't bad. We had about 300 register. So that number is gonna keep coming up. And that's one of the reasons I'm starting slow because I imagine there's a, a backlog at the entry point. Um, but anyway, a few housekeeping things. As participants, your uh, microphones are muted and you don't have the ability to uh, transmit video. So the only way that you have to interaction, interact with us is really two ways. And if you look at the, the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen, um, after participants, there's one that says Q&A and there's one that says chat. The Q&A is where we would like you to post your questions. And we have a couple of breaks in here where Glenn will answer them. And uh, that's where we'll keep track of them. I will be monitoring that. I'll be off screen most of the time monitoring the questions. And when we break, I will feed them to Glenn. The chat box, which is off to the right of that, says things like the webinar just begins. So please put your posts not here, but on Q&A. The post that you would put on the, on the chat would be something like, for some reason, the sound is really not good and we'll see if we can help you. So that will be monitored too, but the questions we wanna have you do on Q&A. So those of you that done webinars before, it's pretty straightforward. Also, I wanted to let you know that uh, Glenn put together quite a list of resources and they're available as a PDF that can be downloaded or accessed from the Know Your Forest or the OSU Forestry and Natural Resource Extension Tree School Online pages. And if you go to the, the Know Your Forest one, just click where it says webinar description by Glenn, it'll take you to the OSU page and right above Glenn's picture is a drop down that has his resources, all kind of links. He'll have a slide pointing to it later and we'll remind you. But also in the future webinars, that's where the resources will be. So um, unlike at a tree school class where you get handouts, here you're gonna have to download the handouts, um, but that's still not a bad deal. Uh, I wanted to also let you know that all of our webinars are being recorded. At the end of the session, they will be transferred into a YouTube file and they will be archived on the Know Your Forest YouTube um, channel and there will be links from that channel to both the know your forest tree school online webpage and the osu forestry and natural resource extension tree school online webpage so we want you to be able to have it and uh, see it again share it with people that couldn't be here today um, right now we're up to 164 participants so so people are, are pulling in the last thing before i introduce glenn is I want to mention that one of the advantages of doing webinars is we can do polling. One of the disadvantages is we don't see your smiling faces and it's not as easy to, to get audience interaction. So the, the people at Zoom built in the polling mechanism so we could get audience interaction. And so after I introduce Glenn, one of the first things he will do is introduce some polling questions for us to find out about you. We'll have some polling questions during the webinar to find out what your concerns are about forest health. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll have a, a wrap up evaluation for you to give us some information of what you thought about it. So it's pretty straightforward. It's if you've ever done 
something like Survey Monkey, it just pops up and you click. It's all multiple choice, no fill in the blank. And after you answer them, you can close it. When enough people have answered them, we will post the results. Um, and the results for the, the wrap up, we may talk about next week. We'll see how they turn out. We may not tell you what they are. So that's it in terms of a uh, housekeeping. So hopefully the house is well kept by now. I, I want to introduce uh, Glenn Ahrens and ask Glenn to turn on his camera. Um, Glenn, as you may know, is the kind of the, the head of Tree School, and uh, he is a uh, forestry and natural resource extension agent for Clackamas, Marion, and Hood River counties. Um, he has a PhD from OSU. He's had a lot of experience in extension before coming to Clackamas County. He was over on the coast in Clatsop County. And I've known him since he was a grad school. He used to do the hardwood silviculture co-op. Incredible guy. Um, in his spare time, you can ask him about Alder. Today, you can just ask him about Forest Health. So take it away, Glenn. Welcome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the introduction. Also, really thank you to the partnership and to Ofri for really setting this up. There's a big team behind us, and it's my pleasure to be here for the takeoff. Uh, I'm just sorry we couldn't all meet at Tree School. Uh, really missed that a month ago today. Uh, but this is uh, our next best thing in this new era. So uh, I should correct you, though. Uh, I'm not a real doctor. I have a master's degree. Um, don't have a PhD, but uh, don't have a PhD. But many years of experience. So so here we go. So first off, I am a forester and I'm a forest ecologist. Uh, I think I'm gonna take my face away so you can focus on some other things. As your extension forester, I work with landowners, resource professionals, the general public. Um, I've been an extension forester for about 20 years, so it puts together my, my training as a forester and ecologist. But the big uh, job for me is just helping people learn whatever they want to learn about trees and forests, pretty wide open. I'm not a forest health expert, but after 20 years of helping people with all their sick tree questions and the, uh, what they want to learn about forest health, you know, I've learned a lot and I'm here to share that. And I'm kind of on the front line, if you will, kind of on the ground with all those sick tree questions and trying to understand forest health, especially now with some of the, uh, the changes that are going on. So my agenda for the afternoon uh, after this introduction and a little bit of getting to know you uh, is really talking about forest health and the fact that it's really um, defined from your own perspective and I want to kind of get your perspectives. Uh, I'm going to review some of the trends in forest health, the common problems. You're going to get a whirlwind tour of the, you know, the top 10 or 15 issues that I see on the ground when I respond to people's questions and the things that we focus on. Uh, after that tour, we're going to have a bit of a break and some Q&A. Uh, after that, we'll get really focused on, you know, what can we do to manage to keep forests healthy uh, from your individual perspectives, uh, your objectives, and especially if you look at the heat and the drought, the climate stress uh, that has occurred, um, and what, what we think about climate change in terms of managing for forests in the future. And really uh, want to make sure you all leave here with some connection to where you go for assistance, uh, the resources and the references that um, you'll see as I share through this a lot of the, the slides and the, then a reference list at the end that'll refer to those and more Q&A at the end. Uh, so that's where we're going. Uh, but I do want to step back and find out who you all are because uh, as I mentioned, I, I really am working in this part of the Willamette Valley, particularly uh, Northwest Oregon, uh, working with landowners and woodland owners, but where are you all from? So it's time for the first polls. Are you seeing the poll? Yes, here they come. I'll let you know you can scroll down in the poll to answer uh, there's three questions. Thank you. 
well, as soon as things start slowing down, this poll is optional. So when we're all done, we'll start looking at the results. Okay. So we're sharing the results and um, a lot of you, a lot of us are from the Willamette Valley. That's where I live. Uh, so good 68%. I see uh, Oregon is well represented, uh, coastal Oregon, Southwest Oregon, uh, some from Washington and a few from around the country, about nine of us. So that's great. I see no international uh, folks, although this, this could be helpful. So this is really important for me, you know, to know the audience uh, and especially in this virtual format, I don't get to see you and ask questions and see where you're, where you're from. And uh, it's focused on Oregon. So that's good that many of us are from Oregon, particularly the North Willamette Valley, the Northwest Oregon area. Uh, but much of what we're going to look at um, is going to be generic going to be principles that apply broadly. Uh, and the key is to connect you um, to the information that's going to be pertinent where you live. And so I hope there will be a lot of useful information that will help you wherever you live. So from there, kind of the first part is really looking at the definition of forest health. And that is very much dependent on your context and your objectives and how you view things. It's also dependent on the environment uh, in a dry oak woodland, a uh, healthy forest may look quite different from what a rainforest, uh, old growth rainforest would look like. Um, so keeping that in mind, um, you know, the range of conditions such as an old growth forest, this is a coastal spruce hemlock and dug fir forest. Uh, it's kind of an old growth ecosystem park, if you will, it is part of a state park in this case. Uh, there's a lot of dead wood, there's a lot of snags and down logs and uh, it's an important part of a healthy old growth forest. But if you're looking at your favorite tree, such as this uh, 70 year old shore pine at my old house in Astoria, and uh, it's our favorite tree, it's very precious to us. And, and when the bark beetles started to attack it, I had a whole different perspective on tree health and how important it was to save one tree. A patch, a 40 acre woodland uh, patch that's being managed, this case about 50 years old. Um, what's your perspective there? An intensively managed plantation, this one's west of Mary's Peak in Lincoln County. Um, you know, a different perspective that the forester and the owner has there. Now something through all of these, uh, thinking about dead trees or, you know, what's killing my tree is kind of a question that pops up in terms of forest health. But of course, dead trees and components of, of dead trees are really an important part of healthy forests. If you ask a wildlife biologist how to inc increase value or habitat, it's often, well, you need a few more dead trees that would help some of the woodpeckers and other um, you know, wildlife, et cetera. And also going back to the earth. That's a whole other topic. A lot of these slides that we're going through would be a, a tree school class unto themselves. Um, I've got another poll for you. I'd like to have you consider what you, how you rate forest health your forest and scroll down to think about the larger forest of Oregon or where you live. All right, we're sharing the results here. So it looks like a lot of us are kind of in the mid range, but it's pretty well distributed. Um, quite a few think, you know, greater than 95% healthy. This is obviously a subjective uh, way to look at things. 
uh, but quite a few in the middle ground there uh, from 60, 80, 90 percent. Um, of course, what I'd really like to know is what's on your mind? What are your concerns specifically that would cause you to give this answer? Uh, looking at the same scale on the overall conditions, it kind of mirrors um, what we think of our individual force. Um, this reminds me that I didn't scroll down to find out how many of you are landowners versus natural resource professionals versus public citizens that maybe don't own forests or manage forests. So I might ask uh, Carrie if she could dig that up and, and, uh, and send it to me later to reflect on, on that because my audience, of course, uh, is composed of both resource professionals, landowners, and general public. Um, so your perspective may depend on what, what kind of a category you're in. So it's important to me, just looking at your perspective, clearly there's a range of perspectives looking even at Oregon's forest, we have different opinions and we have different uh, values of how we rate forest health. And those are all valid. One way of looking at it, of course, is the amount of disease and uh, uh, insect damage, uh, the amount of mortality uh, from you know drought or uh, other causes, fire. Um, we're lucky to have a very active forest health assessment team, both the state uh, forestry and federal forestry in Oregon and Washington and elsewhere in the country um, are monitoring the conditions in the forest and they're doing aerial flyovers. And, and this is the results from 2019, the latest aerial surveys of Oregon. And this is kind of a, a heat map that shows uh, the green is, is healthy or not detecting a lot of damage and the, um, the yellow and the red as the, the warmer it gets, the more uh, damage from insects, disease, uh, weather, um, and fire that they're seeing. Actually, this one is just insects and disease. Uh, I've got something on fire next. I want to um, note that this is from the Forest Health Highlights in Oregon 2019, uh, put together by Department of Forestry and the Forest Service. And you can look, uh, that'll be in the resources where to find these reports for Oregon, Washington, and other areas uh, going back in time as well. Now with that in mind, that heat map made it look like things are really heating up in especially Northeast Oregon and Southwest Oregon, uh, where we know there have been a lot more issues related to, to drought and heat and fire and insects. Uh, but if you look at the actual data from the last 10 years and especially 2019, uh, is less than 3% of the area that's actually rated as having detectable damage. So while it looks pretty hot, it's a, it, you were talking about 97% of the area that wasn't really um, detectable damage from the air. Doesn't mean there's nothing going on there. And this is even after fairly exceptionally hot and dry years. In the last five years, we've had a few. Uh, so I found that rather uh, striking. And this, uh, these results were also shared at the, um, uh, the Forest Health in Oregon State of the State 2020, uh, which is another reference that I'll have for you. In fact, one of the talks at that, uh, conference was a tree mortality in Oregon kind of overview uh, by Andy Gray from the Forest Service and the Northwest Research Station. And it was really striking if you look at Douglas fir as a species, 0.38% uh, uh, annual mortality, you know, as far as the percent of the wood actually that's dead out there in a given year that dies in a year. Um, now about a little more than 1% is harvested, but from fire, insects, disease, or climate stress, or other causes, we're talking about, you know, less than half a percent of the Douglas fir dying. Uh, lodgepole pine, you know, a lot more going on there, more, almost two and a half percent, a lot more issues with bark beetles and things like that in the mountains. Uh, silver fir kind of has some, some issues as well, but still, that's an interesting result there, and I want to encourage you to look for those online, the Forest Health State of the State, all the presentations are online, and there's also a, a video of our new uh, Dean of the College of Forestry, Tom DeLuca, that you might want to look at. So now it's time for a bit of a tour of the problems that I've been seeing over the last 10 years in uh, Northwest Oregon that really have been coming to the fore. Um, and hopefully some of these will be familiar or will be stimulate you to learn more. I'm not going to have time to really talk a lot about how you address all of these problems because that's kind of the, the key to the next part as far as managing for forest health. And uh, it's down the road in a lot of learning that we still have to do about each of these. Uh, if you ask my colleague Dave Shaw, our forest health specialist, um, you know, what's killing the trees? Uh, the answer is almost always this phrase, it's a complex interaction, biotic and abiotic factors. Uh, and sometimes you just have to say there's some bad luck going on. 
But that tree in the previous slide with the dead top, uh, some we call Douglas fir flare out, and many of you in the Willamette Valley are familiar with this. Uh, and most of the time, that kind of top dieback and branch dieback is caused by uh, definitely a drought interaction with a stem canker fungus. And if you look at the twig up close, you see this transition of the dead canker part where the fungus is acting and then the, the live part. And we, we know some things that we can do about that, but a lot of it has to do with just uh, keeping some of the healthier trees around. And in some cases, maybe it's too hot and dry and you might switch species. Uh, another notorious issue in the Willamette Valley, we'll talk about soils later, but when it's too wet, Douglas fir uh, may do all right at the beginning, but oftentimes it finds out it's not happy. It does not like wet feet. You see at stand edges, especially in kind of these mid-age 20 to 30 year old stands that are dense and competing intensively with each other. And at kind of the hot edge of things, uh, we might see more drought and insect interactions. In fact, a lot of these trees um, that I've been seeing will have either uh, bark beetles in the tops or this flathead fir borer uh, that is attracted to drought stress Douglas fir and takes them out. Another issue, especially around the Willamette Valley at lower elevations with our true firs, such as grand fir and noble fir, uh, they're notorious for um, uh, having trouble with drought again, drought stress and being knocked out by uh, fir engraver beetles, uh, oftentimes starts in the tops and moves down particularly a lot of overgrown Christmas tree farms uh, at lower elevations where noble fir in particular is not really used to that. And uh, is everybody seeing the video? I had a, a message that said that I should keep the video up a little bit more. Um, Another problem, this is an example, kind of a combination of uh, you know, human interaction with our, our horses and with some of our machinery, uh, compacting soils, uh, wet soils to begin with. Again, Douglas fir, like the one on the right, uh, is dying uh, because it doesn't, again, like the wet feet. Ponderosa pine, in this case, the valley pine, is surviving under these conditions, but um, the, the Douglas fir dropping out uh, might have been a delicate balance. They might consider uh, if they want to keep the Douglas fir, they'd have to uh, do something about that, maybe stop uh, the compaction that's going on, but otherwise switch to another species such as pine. Again, human interaction, when we build a driveway and we might compact the soil around the tree's root system, these, these large Willamette Valley pines, they were actually close to 200 years old. Um, they uh, lasted for about eight years, but then in a drought cycle, the, um, the California fire spine, if spark beetles uh, took out these drought stressed trees it took about two years to kill them. Here's a decent soil with good weed control, a Christmas tree plantation, Douglas fir, but why are some of them dying? And everyone that I pulled had a J root and had been planted with a, a really compacted and J rooted sy root system. It was too shallow of a hole, for instance, and that can have uh, you know early and long lasting consequences. Getting a lot of calls about red alder dying in the Willamette Valley margin. If red alder we think of as a native species adapted, especially around riparian areas. Uh, but even when their feet are wet near the stream or irrigated in a street tree, uh, we're seeing top die back. And again, a stem canker, kind of a drought uh, and canker fungus interaction going on. And a uh, close uh, relative of red alder, white alder, is actually much more tolerant of that in the Willamette Valley. So that's something to think about um, when we've had a drought cycle like this. Um, in terms of red alder at lower elevations, you know, below about 400 feet. Here's one that I was happy to learn more about at the Forest Health Conference. Uh, Beth Wilhite studied the big leaf maple dieback and found that um, actually we have a better explanation now, a combination of drought and heat stress um, with this insect, a leaf hopper, uh, that is really the primary agent causing the leaves to, uh, to be smaller, to die early. Uh, and drop off uh, during the summer. Uh, so there's kind of a new new uh, discovery about what's going on with big leaf maple dieback. One of the ones that's really uh, still um, concerning and puzzling is, is mature western red cedar dying back. Uh, we're seeing that in the Willamette Valley and the margins and the hills and up into Washington and British Columbia. A lot of uh, scrutiny of this and still no real clear uh, explanation except that we strongly suspect that the combination of exposure, large trees even with their feet wet, 
um, that are experienced in the heat and the dry atmosphere. And that's something we would like to know more about. So if you see this, uh, I'd like you to get in touch with us or th through the Department of Forestry about Western Red Cedars dying, especially where you don't think they should because they're well watered. One of the main causes of dying trees in Northwest Oregon for a long time has been root disease. And any of you who have been involved in managing trees for a while, uh, you certainly have run into that, are aware of it because it's considered to be the most abundant uh, uh, pathogen, uh, estimates of 10 to 15% of uh, Northwest Oregon in, partic in particular have root disease of one kind or another. I'm gonna review some of the common ones. Uh, our malaria root disease is actually less common on Douglas fir uh, from what people have told me, but we're seeing some major pockets of that, uh, in this case up around the Sandy River corridor on mature trees, and it has a telltale uh, symptom of uh, kind of this basal uh, resin bleeding, and if you dig under the bark, you see the white fungal mat. The more common and notorious one is laminated root rot, um, which uh, often kills trees, but many times they can stand for decades before they die. Uh, often you don't know it until they fall over because their roots are rotted. And I'm not spending a whole lot of time on the uh, culture or treatment uh, response to these, but in the case of root rots, are one of our most common problems. You know, the key uh, in all diseases, but particularly here, is to identify what species it is. And we have good tools for that, and we can help you identify uh, what species of root disease you have. Um, and once you know that, there's some management terms, management uh, measures you can take, uh, especially resistant tree species, knowing what's uh, likely to survive on that site when the soil has a root disease. I think the second most common problem we're, we're seeing with Douglas fir uh, mature trees, especially of course is storm damage and bark beetles uh, or bark beetles interacting with uh, storm damage, root disease and drought. And uh, it's one of the big issues that we focus on. And there's a lot of good help from our forest entomologists, such as Christine Buell and Dave Shaw and others uh, on how to manage for it. Uh, if you have blowdown of almost any species, fresh food on the ground for bark beetles, then they can build up a population and threaten your healthy trees nearby. Uh, they all leave a telltale uh, track under the bark and it helps us identify them. And you see that uh, boring dust coming out um, and the red dust means that it's a bark beetle boring into the bark. Now, in some cases, here's some uh, bark beetle kill in a mature Douglas fir forest. Uh, this forest just had root disease, and during the drought, the beetles sought out these trees. There was not a big batch of down wood nearby, so that's another kind of an interaction. There's something we can do to manage bark beetles, and there's a lot of great uh, publications and resources about this. Um, but each one is a little different. The Douglas fir beetle is very different from the pine beetle, et cetera, which um, I'll get into the pine beetle in a minute. In the case of the Douglas fir beetle, it's really important though, if you have down trees, uh, maybe even three, four, five big trees down, it's the larger trees that breed the beetles. And you can either remove those and get rid of the beetle food, uh, and it often takes two years to build up. Uh, or there's also, uh, in this case, a, a hormone called MCH that you can put on trees to uh, repel beetles, fake them out so they think there are beetles in that tree. So that's something, again, in the references you can learn more about. But uh, again, knowledge is power, and you, you can do some things to prevent bark beetle outbreaks in this case. Now, pines are notorious for the smaller wood and the slash uh, building up bark beetles, especially um, the Ips genus of beetles. And uh, lately in the Willamette Valley and around into the Columbia Gorge, the uh, California five spine Ips has kind of risen up uh, in infamy as a, a tree killer, particularly into the Columbia Gorge. Uh, but in the Willamette Valley, we've long known about it and down into California. And leaving uh, slash and wood on the ground for during the summer months will breed bark beetles that can go next door and kill standing trees, such as in this example here. Um, they had just finished thinning out all the dead trees a few months ago, and the slash pile they left uh, bred a new batch of beetles that killed some more. And an important thing to think about with uh, especially the beetle kill or the, the bugs in the trees is that once the trees are dead and they've been dead for a while, the tree killing bugs are gone. So the urgency to remove the trees to sanitize and reduce uh, infestation is, is uh, 
is gone really. And so then it's a matter of, do you mind having a dead tree there for wildlife or other things? Is it a hazard, et cetera? But once the, they're dried out and the beetles are gone, so that's something to keep in mind. So I just gave you a view of probably what covers about 95% of the sick tree calls and the things that are uh, kind of front and center for us in Northwest Oregon. And a lot of these spill over to the east side, but you have different um, combinations of species and, and the bugs and things over there. Um, you might notice that there's an awful lot of support for Dave Shaw's uh, statement about the complex interaction. Um, but we know many of these interactions, they are actually, actually aren't that complex. And uh, the more we understand them, the more we can use that knowledge to, uh, to uh, watch out for these and to manage uh, them and reduce the damage. And one of the, the main things we can do, of course, is make sure to plant trees that are well adapted. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but if you look down this list, there's a good amount of resources and help for understanding these. And if you have this problem or want to understand this problem, you know, we can definitely help you go from here to learn more about it and what to do about it. And in this day and age, when a lot of it is up to us to do our own research, uh, we want to have more webinars. Um, as I mentioned, just about each of these uh, slides I'm showing could be a, a, a half day workshop or a class unto itself to understand these things. Uh, we have great resources between the Department of Forestry in Oregon, the Extension Service, the Forest Service, uh, our forest health publications are available and are being updated periodically. So I've got that certainly for you. And consulting with your local forestry assistance connection, myself as an extension forester, uh, just about every county in Oregon, we have a, a, an extension forester that can help you, as well as the Department of Forestry and other the Soil Water Conservation Districts, Natural Resource Conservation Service, et cetera. So if you're all still there, I have another poll because I want to know what are your concerns about insects and disease and fire and climate change? All right, thanks for sharing. I wanna thank my uh, person in the background, Carrie Berger is helping me out with this and hosting this and doing the polls. And really thank you a lot, Carrie. So the level of concern about insects and disease, high, about half of us, uh, over half high to extreme, moderate. Um, a couple of us said low. How about fire? That's right in the same ballpark, but a little, a little higher yet, we're looking at I see there's more than one, we can add more than 100%. So uh, certainly fire is a top of mind concern. And climate change is similar, pretty high up on our, our list. So I'm interested to see this, this dis distribution. So thanks for putting your input there. And um, moving on from that, I think it's time to uh, have a little bit more Q&A because I think there's some things coming in as I, as I warned Mike, I was going to go through kind of the the palette of insects and disease and forest health issues, climate, et cetera, and I want to have more time for questions if there are any. All right. You there, Glenn? Why don't you turn your camera on and let folks see your face? That was one of the questions that came in is, can we see Glenn's face? Oh, that's the video you wanted, eh? <laughs> 
That's what they wanted the video. They wanted to see your face. Now, I don't know why they can't see my face, but that's okay. Um, well, I've got this headset on because the audio is better if I'm doing that. Yeah, definitely. So I'll, I'll just do a few questions and we'll, we'll take about what, 10 minutes here or so and up to then. So yeah. these, are, these are ones that people have posted. I'll go from the beginning. So I see many Western red cedar dying off in the last two years, even in riparian areas. Any diagnosis relating to these effects that are most likely precipitated by climate change? So he asks the question and answers the question. So what do you think? Western red cedar dying off. Well, as I mentioned in that, you know, we've seen it exactly what you're saying that the large previously healthy robust trees that are in riparian areas are down on the bottom where you think cedar would be really happy and they're dying fairly quickly. It almost looks like the phytophthora root disease that quickly kills a uh, port for cedar, for example, in Southwest Oregon. We've been looking, we have not found uh, an insect or a disease without a lot of sampling. Uh, we really strongly suspect that it's the the next level of uh, drought and heat and uh, atmospheric demand for moisture of those large happy crowns that haven't experienced that before. And I have something that sheds light on that in the next session. Uh, but right now that is the theory, but we are looking uh, at a more in-depth physiological explanation. In fact, wanting to convene some of the scientists to look closer at that. All right, next question. Um, every winter, some of my mature dug fur tip over. So could be root rot, could be flooding. What do you think? Well, usually when a tree tips over, you can figure out why. Um, if you look at the roots, uh, we can examine uh, trees for root disease and usually tell if they've had a root disease uh, from the appearance of the roots and the rot, and uh, particularly with the laminated root disease, the more common one, but uh, also our malaria, we can usually figure it out. Of course, if it's a question of the wind maybe came from a different direction, if there were changes next to the tree. Uh, one of the challenges with a lot of our trees, especially in the valley, is that some of the soils are pretty shallow. The water table comes up and, and limits the root system to a fairly shallow plate. And those root systems, especially when things get saturated, uh, it could be extraordinarily wet year or just, um, again, something a wind from a different direction in a shallow root system. Uh, usually a, a, a good inspection can give the answer. All right, excellent. A uh, couple more. I'm starting a new forest. Trees are from two years old to 30 years old. Is it beneficial to mow the grasses between the trees? The understory is underdeveloped, but only a year old in some. If not mowed, the gr grasses get three feet tall. So in many cases, grass is a very strong competitor for moisture, soil moisture. Uh, in our in our summer, and the roots can be quite deep, uh, particularly with small trees that haven't fully explored the roots uh, rooting depth that a tree has potential to explore. The grass competition is is severe. Um, grasses also harbor rodents and other things that uh, prey on the trees. So in many cases, it really helps to reduce the grass, especially until the trees shade them out. Now, once the trees are have a good dense canopy and the grass is pretty thin underneath, then uh, the trees are winning and it's not as, as uh, big a deal to have the grass. Okay, next question. Um, I think this relates to the aerial survey that State Forestry and the Forest Service does. What is the accuracy of aerial surveillance versus other measures, boots on the ground, et cetera? So maybe set a little bit about the, uh, the protocols that they use for uh, pest identification with their surveys. Yeah, that's in a fascinating story in itself. And you really ought to go to a presentation by the actual surveyors. So um, our, our state and federal folks, uh, I know Danny Norlander is one I think of, and uh, also I think Christine Buell goes up. Uh, but there are certain things they can detect easily from the air. And I've never had the pleasure or privilege to be up with them. Um, so it's those things that really show up. So, so for instance, this, uh, the bark beetle die back, the pockets of root rot disease, uh, bear damage where trees suddenly flare up, um, you know, big insect outbreaks, those things are easy to see. The, the red cedar dieback, for example, when I asked them about that, they said, that's really hard to see because those cedars kind of have thin crowns and they may be dying from the top down. They often tend to have a yellowish or reddish tinge from the air. So there's an example of one that's not so easy to see. Another one I often see even driving by that I know shows up is the Swiss needle cast, just has this real yellow cast to the forest. 
certainly out on the coast that stands out and that's one they look for. It really stands out. They so I'll give you one more okay. and then we'll let you go back to your slides. This is great. Appreciate you handling all these questions. Will you get dead tops from competitive stress? You had drought and insect titles in the slide, but wonder if stress looks different from insects and drought. Is, is, can you tell that visually? Well, when I hear the word stress, I kind of want to know what is the stress, and I often default to drought stress, um, but there's, that's the lack of soil moisture, and oftentimes the top of the tree is the first to die under drought stress or with root disease, something that makes it harder to get water to the top. Uh, there's also just the dry atmosphere or the even like uh, what we call a parched blight where the wind and the cold dry air in the winter even can um, brown or burn leaves um, sometimes at the tops or on one side. Um, so you know outright drought death occurs and often occurs from the top down. Um, I think other stresses might cause that just depending on what part of the tree you know is most vulnerable. So I would add that Competitive stress, sometimes it's hard to tell if they're too crowded or just not enough water because the symptoms are the same. But certainly, you know, if the trees are eight feet apart and six inches in diameter, there's not enough water for everybody. So it, it, thinning is often the answer in these things. And I know we'll get to some, some of those kind of things. So I'm going to let you get back to your slides um, and we'll come back here at the end, Glenn. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Mike. And thank you all for your questions. And I hope, hope that was useful. Uh, yeah, you mentioned competition stress or competitive stress, and that was, that's a little harder to sort out because the competition is for light, nutrients, and moisture. And so it could be all of those things that cause a tree to wink out uh, sometimes, you know, from the top down. All right. So I heard a request that you wanted to see my face. Uh, so I guess I'll leave the video on and, and, and I'll try not to look at myself. So in this part, I really want to start looking at, you know, what are the things that, that we can do and, and what is sort of the outlook and the, and the context of managing for healthy forests. Um, and so I've given you this, this list here, this sort of a, a menu or a recipe for success. And, uh, you know, I don't like to just put lists up, but it really is uh, kind of the whole um, spectrum of things that we can do. And th these are, it looks like a recipe for success, but it's also more of a wish list. Um, you know, who has time to do all of these things uh, on every acre? But the more that we are focused on forest health and see issues, the more that we start saying, what can we do to, uh, to help? Um, this is kind of a collection of the concepts that from forestry, some of these go back centuries, you know, just understanding what is the climate, the soils and the topography, and how do we expect a certain tree to uh, to thrive or not, what are the limitations for each species, um, and then if we're going to select the trees or we're going to manage again and not just let you know nature or uh, volunteers come in, uh, what do we plant and what do we leave and what do we take uh, to select, uh, and then the heightened awareness and paying more attention to all the threats. So we always want to learn, you know, what's coming, what are the vulnerable. Um, vulnerabilities of a forest in terms of insects or disease and when we can identify those you know we can um, we can do something about it or prevent it or avoid it uh, with climate extremes uh, that's kind of a an extra level um, of course not as predictable uh, that we want to be looking at and then you know do no harm for prevent damage don't damage the trees don't damage the soil uh, controlling weeds and invasive species uh, especially now with more and more invasive weeds as well as um, insects and diseases uh, lowering stand density, keeping trees healthy uh, or well spaced and having better access to nutrients and moisture and sunlight, uh, reducing the fuel hazards to, you know, reduce the probability that it'll burn up, uh, maybe having diverse forests that, um, a more diverse portfolio, if you will, or diversity of species. Uh, so if something happens to one, uh, you've got others. I mean, those are kind of all the things that we think of to do, but exactly how we do it, you know, that's the devil's in the details. So I am going to review some of this and then really focus a bit on climate um, and some of the more recent uh, issues we've had with drought and heat. Uh, but, you know, the basic forestry 101 for all of us, uh, especially in a new area, is understanding, you know, what is the climate uh, likely to be? What are those extremes that might be limiting factors over the life of a tree um, or our outlook on the life of a tree? 
aspect, you know, the, what direction the slope faces, the steepness of the slope, where the water is flowing to and from, um, elevation, hot, cold, warm, dry, often changes with elevation as well as these other factors. And then soils, you know, one of the most important things, um, you know, all of the factors being equal. Well, that's a lot to figure out. Um, I, especially with the concerns and the interests we've had in climate and climate change, um, looking at climate variability and climate extremes. And uh, I use this website, uh, it's a really good one, the PRISM uh, website uh, that I listed here just to look at a local uh, climate signature. Um, here in the Molala area where I am, uh, you know, average summer rainfall is five inches, but uh, some years we only have two inches. And those are the real tests of what trees are gonna survive. Understanding your soils and the soil limitations, um, starting with the web soil web survey, web soil survey. Um, if you look at an example of a soil, uh, the Jore soil this is one of the famous and common soils that holds 10 inches of available water um, versus, you know, the hard scrabble soil that only holds three inches, you know, understanding uh, what those limitations are. Knowing your trees especially uh, here's a publication that's really useful, especially for uh, people new to forestry. Uh, so you know, go back to that, that's in our reference list, Establishing Managing Trees in Western Oregon. Uh, and some of the pages in that publication looking at the performance of species under different conditions, uh, really getting used to Douglas fir, you know, pine, grand fir, red cedar, hemlock, our main conifers, as well as the hardwoods. Um, how do they respond to low light? How they respond to wet soil? Douglas fir doesn't like wet feet. It needs sunlight, moderately adapted to drought, whereas red cedar tolerates shade, um, is uh, not adapted to drought, tolerates wet soil, very vulnerable to animals. Those are the things you want to learn. So in terms of climate change and the climate change context, it starts you know, with understanding the local climate. And when we first started uh, looking at climate change in the forestry world, actually a lot of us, ex the Extension Forestry um, group from around the country, not just Oregon, but the whole country, we really wanted to understand what's going on with this climate change and what do we know about it and what can we help other people learn about in terms of forestry. And I have this map to just show just kind of the, from the data looking back, that uh, you know, since the 1950s and looking more at the recent 30-year uh, period, you know, climate has changed. It's gotten warmer. This is average um, winter temperatures. Looking up in the north, the high latitudes, Fairbanks um, in the, the Arctic of Russia, uh, we've got up to four degrees Fahrenheit of, of warming on average. You look here in Oregon and it's really a much weaker signal, more like one to two degrees of observed change uh, of winter temperatures in this case. And you can look at just about anything you want from some of these uh, websites that allow you to look at uh, changes in winter or summer or annual temperature. And I find it really useful to try to kind of calibrate my eye and say, well, what's going on now locally? It really depends on where in the world are you? And uh, I just look at my local weather station um, and, and actually using that tool that I mentioned that's in the references, the PRISM uh, Climate uh, Explorer. And I can just look at a, an area around Molala and look at the, you know, what is the uh, temperature uh, record. And if you look at that, you see, well, it's, it's changed, uh, you know, about a degree and a half on average, but look at the range. So there is a trend, it's significant, but of course things change a lot from year to year. And if you look again at the, the summer rainfall, you know, from the growing season uh, from June to September, again, in my area, about five inches on average. And there are those years uh, such as 2018 and 2015 and back in 2003 that were really pretty dry years, two inches of rain all, all summer long. Uh, you go back another 50 years and we had another period that was kind of similar. And the trees again have to, you know, live through that if they're going to live longer than 50 years, sometimes longer than 20 if they just got planted before a major drought. And again, using uh, some of the tools just to kind of keep it in perspective, if you look at 
uh, our drought. Uh, this was from 2018, one of our driest summers uh, in recent record. And, you know, we were at about 20 uh, to 30 percent of average summer rain, that two inches in my area. Uh, but if you look at California, they were stuck on zero uh, all summer long and then in years prior. And so that, uh, you know, puts our drought in perspective. It's nothing like what they've experienced there. Of course, if you go across the country, you would see a whole different climate in uh, North Carolina, for instance, the other uh, big forestry state across the country from us, uh, you know, they have wet summers and they had a really wet summer in 2018. Something that really helped me put this together, especially scratching my head over, you know, why are the western red cedar dying and why are the alder dying when their feet are in the water? They're down in a well watered area, the last place you expect. Um, trees to die from drought. And so one of the more complex uh, factors is just the combination of heat and dry atmosphere and how does that demand the moisture or suck the moisture out of a leaf up in the air. And particularly for the cedars and the alders, um, their tops are up there in the hot dry summer in, in the Willamette Valley. And if I look at this, this variable, which we call vapor pressure deficit, but it basically looks at the demand for water from the atmosphere, depending on temperature and humidity, at, and the leaf itself, and the temperature of the leaf, uh, it can really put a lot of stress on a tree, even if the feet are in the water, the roots, I should say. So looking at this variable from my area, uh, scratching my head about the cedar dying, I saw that this, three out of the last five years, uh, this exceeded, um, all previous records for the last 50. And so having successive years like that, you know, that's a clue that maybe that level of atmospheric moisture demand, even though the temperature differences and the droughts, you know, are a more subtle factor, it's looking at the, the whole atmosphere and how it demands water. So that's a prime suspect. And if that kind of thing again happens again, uh, or more often then that's something, of course, that uh, some species just won't be adapted to that. So speaking of adaptation, when we decide how we decide uh, what to plant and where, uh, we've learned a lot from genetic studies over the, the decades and we rely on a geographic uh, seed zone. And for Douglas fir and other species, you know, we studied genetics uh, for our major species enough to kind of know, you know, what's the zone where the parent trees are likely to be adapted to that local climate and let's grow trees from those parents and plant locally adapted trees. And this is what we all use to purchase seedlings uh, and to look at, at, at genetics and, and what's appropriate. So not only the difference between a Douglas fir and a pine, uh, but also within species of Douglas fir, which is really quite a specialist. If you talk to geneticists, Douglas fir is rather a specialist. So it is very locally adapted. And you, know, you wouldn't want to plant Douglas fir from uh, Klamath Falls uh, over in Eugene uh, and or the coast up in the mountains vice versa. So this is the rule for us um, but it sort of presumes that the climate in that zone is relatively stable um, and shortly after we started focusing on learning about climate change in our extension forestry group we all had a big uh, conference up in Fairbanks where a lot of research had gone on and also where uh, they'd experienced drastic changes with uh, that four degrees or five degrees of increased uh, average temperature, uh, permafrost melting, uh, fires being worse. So we kind of immersed ourselves and I came back home and said, well, what do we know about Douglas fir in Oregon? And I read this paper uh, by Brad Sinclair and Glenn Howe in 2007 with this rather stark statement uh, about the need for intervention to uh, help Douglas fir adapt. Um, and that seed zones might be changing. Current populations of trees may be poorly adapted to future climates. And that was 2007. And they had gone so far as to make this interesting tool. Uh, and I'll explain this a little bit. If you look at the seed zone number four for Douglas fir on the central Oregon coast, they mapped the climate using some pretty nice tools to look at climatic factors such as, you know, summer temperatures, winter temperatures, uh, growing season length, chilling, uh, other factors. And so that yellow climate map matches up with the geographic zone for seed zone four. And then they use some of these tools that are coming out for projecting the future climate and saying, well, the climate uh, around Newport and Lincoln City is going to move up towards uh, Vernonia and uh, um, 
you know, the Northern Oregon Coast Range in about 50 years. And gosh, should we be uh, planting trees from Newport up in uh, Vernonia? And of course that was something that was rather um, extreme. And they further developed that in, uh, over the last, uh, you know, 13 years or so. Uh, and they have a fairly sophisticated tool and it's interesting to look at and play with because it will map current climate, it'll map past climate, and you can then start playing with projecting future climates using some of the different uh, projection tools. And it then maps the seed zones and you can start thinking about what would I do if I thought I wanted to anticipate this climate change. Now I have to say that very few foresters um, feel like we're ready to do this in Oregon. Um, but if you look at the options, there is the status quo, which is good advice to stick with local native seed zones. Um, you know, there's a long range in the seed zone from north to south. You could even go to the southern end. Um, but, uh, you know, that still seems like a reasonable approach until we know more. But then if you talk to some foresters and, and uh, geneticists, they say, well, the genetically improved stock, which is really universally applied in most large landowners, they've been breeding trees for several generations and they've got trees that are expected to be robustly adapted to a wide range of environment, resistant to disease, as well as um, having good growth characteristics. Uh, they would say plant some of our um, genetically improved trees. And then there's the thought of, do we mix our bets and plant some from um, a seed zone, you know, from this seed lot selection tool uh, that, you know, a mapped zone that says, uh, maybe we'll plant some trees from the Roseburg area and mix them in. How would we keep track of that? These are all things that people are thinking about, but they're just now studying long-term uh, from uh, north to south, uh, how we might do this. So the research is not done, um, but there are some folks trying it. And the kind of question is, where would you land in this spectrum of choices? Wait and see for more information. So in the context, uh, if you're not ready to do assisted migration, as we call it, uh, you want to, again, wait and see what the research shows. And also just what does the climate do? You can spend some more time just observing uh, and informing yourself and see what you think over time. Um, this context, though, of managing the forest, I really need to bring up this key aspect. Looking back at our historic forest types, uh, all of our major forest types uh, in Western Oregon, as well as Eastern, have been driven by fire. Even out on the coast in the rainforest where wind is a major factor, there are still uh, fire replacement, stand replacement fires that have occurred. Um, and you look at, the, especially the Willamette Valley and sort of our low to mid elevations, you know, the historic forest, uh, had, there was a lot of fire, um, either from lightning or from uh, native people who managed the land with fire, such that our oak woodlands were managed with or affected by frequent fire. A lot of our Douglas fir forests in the valley and the foothills were subject to low surface fires fairly frequently, maybe 50 years, uh, mixed severity, some areas that were intense and some less so. And as you get into the more moist types, you get more stand replacement fires and a longer return that we think of when we think of sort of our old growth forests uh, on that three to 400 years or more. So fire was the driver in the old days for many of these forests. But what about the future? First off, fire is not prevalent so much in our managed landscape and our lower elevations in particular. Uh, we don't really tolerate a lot of it. Uh, we may use it for management in the future uh, but what are we going to do as these forests get more dense in the absence of fire uh, in some of the drier types? Uh, and if the climate changes and the higher density forests that used to go a long time without uh, burnable conditions uh, become more of a hazard. So the kinds of things we're looking at for management in the absence of fire, and certainly we do like to be able to influence the outcome of things in our lands, um, what are our choices? Now, one obvious one is just to favor the more heat and drought tolerant species in planting and thinning. Uh, another one is uh, considering just kind of manage for that warmer or drier end of the spectrum. So in terms of uh, a Douglas fir, um, kind of a moist, dense Doug fir hemlock type 
Um, if you were to thin that out more, have less hemlock, uh, it would act more like a drier Douglas fir type. And in fact, when fire was more frequent, it thinned out the hemlock and the Douglas fir. Uh, and, and so there's a sort of a, a correlation or a somewhat of a corollary between a drier forest and one that has more frequent fire. Sometimes that, that holds, but higher up in the mountains, perhaps, you know, uh, where things are still pretty moist, it's more of a choice we might make. But certainly on the margins where we've got Douglas fir, we're seeing more stress than we used to, things like that. You know, we might be looking at switching from more of a, a Douglas fir grand fir type to a Douglas fir pine incense cedar type if we go south. Um, here, in, even in the valley, pine and oak are certainly um, more likely to survive and thrive with heat and drought than Douglas fir and some of those marginal sites in the valley and around to Hood River. So these are things that we're certainly thinking about, but we don't have a lot of experience with. Now, another thing kind of bread and butter for us in managing forests to reduce stress uh, is to just ensure that the trees have adequate growing space. They have enough light and water and nutrients for each tree just to be healthier. And, you know, nature tends to let the trees grow and become dense and thin each other out until the next uh, fire or other thing comes and thins it out. But we certainly can intervene and thin on purpose. And uh, with the question about the grass, for example, or managing for weeds uh, to reduce competition. Uh, so those two things, weed management and spacing and thinning to keep our trees more vigorous are a bit of a, um, a hedge against vulnerability and keep forests and trees more resilient. But again, there's the devil in the details into how you do that and do you do it well enough to make a difference. You know, this graphic is just looking at how we manage our forests as they develop if we start with a clearing or a regeneration stage and managing the weeds as we might look at them competing with trees, uh, which then become the understory or the associated vegetation once we think things are okay. And you really need this longer term perspective over time and what you do early on uh, to knock the grass or the weeds back just so the Douglas fir or other trees establish, then that of course will set the stage for complete dominance of the trees in the future. And here again, that understanding of your site conditions, you know, as an example here, a recent uh, planting we did at Hopkins Demonstration Forest, we had a good soil, it holds, you know, a good amount of water, probably in that 10 inch range. Uh, we have good performance after three years, we did some weed control, but uh, they're still competing with, with a lot of other vegetation, but they're established and off and running. Uh, another site I visited nearby with a very different soil, low water holding capacity. They planted it twice, going on three times this year. Um, they have a low survival uh, in the last few years, and it's a lot is due to the, the soil differences as well as uh, perhaps the weeds being a much more important factor when there's less resources to go around compared to this site. So of course that would carry through to older stages as well, but pretty soon the name of the game is once the trees are established, it's the competition between the trees. And of course the basic principle, if you've, and any of you have seen uh, Steve Fitzgerald's uh, class on density management, um, but if not, that's another tree school class coming up. So as I mentioned uh, here, the topic of thinning and spacing, that's another class that you should take if you haven't. Uh, but the basic principle of a lot of tr little trees equals one big tree. And we, as foresters, um, we have these guidelines that are well developed over, you know, how many trees is about the right amount, depending on the size of the tree. So at uh, eight inches, it's more like uh, 300 to 450 trees in that range. And if you've got more than, in this case, 468, you know, which came from a formula, obviously, um, but then it's overcrowded. It's not beyond the maximum, but it's not the range that we'd like. The 12 inch average stand, you know, between 150 and 250 trees. And of course, the bigger they get, the fewer that you need to fill the space, but not be overly crowded. So of course, that basic, just a visual, a 29 year old stand um, in the coast range planted at 400 trees per acre, the dug for one, and now they're completely dominating. I had to use a flash just to get a picture in the middle of June. And the same uh, research area with a plot that was thin 10 years earlier, um, a very different kind of forest trees that would have more vigor and more access to moisture and nutrients and sunlight. 
and we use a real basic uh, kind of indicator to look at that. Uh, if these trees are all the same age, which they easily could be, um, you know, in this stand, you'd see them developing uh, towards a lot of uh, winners and losers over time as they overcrowd and compete. In this stand, uh, a lot more of them would be uh, equitably spaced uh, and have better crowns. And we look at the crown and the crown ratio, how much of the tree has green branches, and that middle ground and stable and vigorous is kind of a target for trees that are going to have enough uh, growing space, moisture, sunlight, and nutrients. Uh, and on the far right, it's maybe a, too much of a good thing, a very open grown tree, and the far left is one that's going to die out, and it would not stand up well if you were to thin around it. So the same principles as far as a, a tolerance of stress, a tree that has good vigor and a good crown uh, and all the resources it needs, uh, in its order of priority to allocate its food resources, you can start at the bottom of the list. A vigorous tree has enough extra juice to grow uh, well in diameter to have protective chemicals that actually help reduce fungal advance. Uh, it has enough sap and moisture to pitch out bark beetles. It stores more carbohydrates uh, that allow it to get through hard times. And if a tree is very stressed and has a small crown, it's only gonna be maybe in the top three priorities and it won't have enough reserves to get through hard times. Um, it won't have defensive chemicals. So that's kind of the reason that we focus on managing the crown of the tree and the vigor of the tree. So if you kind of look at the big picture again, this is a, a drone's eye view of our Hopkins demonstration forest here, just a little bit um, away from me, a few miles. And oh, you can see a couple of dead trees in there. Um, but our overall perspective is that in the big picture, you know, forests in Oregon, especially Western Oregon, are still relatively healthy. I'd say quite healthy, considering the years of very, you know, challenging drought and heat that we've experienced. Uh, nothing like California again, or some other areas in the West. Um, but we know to keep forests healthy, uh, you know, we're increasingly uh, attentive and aware and focused on looking at climate and, and the extremes and the variation that might occur and, and the stress that occurs and knowing what diseases and insects are here and maybe what invaders might be coming. So if we go back to our, uh, our wish list of the things that we'd like to be able to do, again, the challenge here is that this looks like we have some answers and this is a recipe, but these are all really important and time consuming steps if we're going to manage a forest um, to try to, to make it healthy from our perspective and compared to just letting things you know take their course you know depending on when fire comes depending on what the weather does uh, and we're not always going to get it right so the devil is in the details again and I hope that you know there are tools available to help all of us understand these better the climate of our site the microclimate the differences between uh, the top of the hill and the bottom of the hill, and particularly these soil um, uh, attributes and the things that change from, you know, one side of the hill to the other, but also just the random changes in the soil parent material and the rocky sites versus the deep uh, well-watered sites that might be right next to each other. This thing about planting um, well-adapted species and the uncertainty about what those are with seed zones and with climate change. Uh, that is one of the big areas that we really need to kind of uh, focus on what happens over time and maybe pay attention uh, to the research as well as some uh, trial and error that we might do on our own. We always want to pay attention to the threats of climate extremes and sex disease, but now some of those threats might be changing themselves. Um, so even more for us to, to look towards As far as the you know details of the rest of this list, <laughs> uh, you know really again want you to look for opportunities to uh, to share what you've learned, uh, maybe with some field tours or come to some of the workshops. Um, we're also looking at doing more uh, virtual webinar type of um, outings, if we will. Really like to get out in the field, and so I'm looking for ways to do that with video cameras. Now I have hardly even touched on. Uh, reducing fuel hazards, which sometimes goes hand in hand with thinning and pruning and other treatments, uh, because that topic is going to be another webinar in this series, and it's one that is coming up uh, 
actually outside of the tree school webinar series we're going to have a focused uh, set of webinars on that and you'll hear about that soon as well i believe we're going to start in may with some uh, wildfire prevention and basics of managing for fuel hazards and hazard reduction the topic of managing for diverse forests what does that mean what kind of diversity um, i showed the slide of the hopkins demonstration forest um, and we we have 25 different little management units. We have a variety of different forests. It's all within um, a three or 400 foot elevation range. It's mostly dug fir and cedar, and yet there seems to be quite a bit of diversity in the types of forests we have um, from you know small patches and thin patches and selectively managed uh, and, and the mix of species. And so maybe some of that, of course, is something we want to look at for making our forests more resilient. And there are some workshops coming up on managing older forests and trying to manage with selection and for diversity. I um, hope to get those out, not as part of the tree school webinars, but as part of some separate offerings in both uh, uh, Clackamas and Marion County in my case, and probably others in other counties. So I know my audience comes from a wide uh, variety of backgrounds and you might seek your sources of assistance uh, depending on your level of knowledge here but certainly you want to start with um, the assist assistance available from me your extension forester or my colleagues elsewhere in oregon and other states and the department of forestry odf uh, stewardship foresters are, are there and the natural resource conservation service soil and water conservation districts a lot of good public assistance really focused on helping you uh, assess your own situation, uh, as well as uh, incentive programs that might help you with thinning or fuels reduction or weed control or favoring your uh, conservation uh, priorities such as Oregon Oak, White Oak Woodlands. Um, so starting there is a good place. And then of course, when it gets down to the getting the work done, uh, then you're I'd like to have you raise your hands and tell me how many of you are do it yourself, but then hiring the help you need uh, for the bigger jobs foresters, arborists, loggers, uh, contractors, pesticide applicators. And as part of finding that out, uh, a good way to do it with our partnership for forestry education. I'm so grateful we we're able to come together and, and do this uh, webinar series together. They have great resources on their Know Your Forest website and their landowner assistance guide. Uh, so I'd advise you to go there. And as Mike mentioned at the beginning, and I'll remind you that the, the resources for, you know, for this talk, the, the most of the sites that I referred to in, in the slides are on this uh, website here in this resource uh, guide. It's a document, a PDF document, but the link should be live as well, so you don't have to print it out. And of course, me as your extension forester, uh, consider me a resource. And so that I don't forget, the next series coming up, I'm looking forward to it, especially it not being me in the hot seat. Uh, but Tiffany, I hope you feel good about this. This is a, a, a great opportunity to share what you know about making shiitake happen uh, with shiitake mushrooms growing your own. I guess we're at the end, Mike. Well, at least the end of your presentation. You can hear everyone clapping, Glenn. Amazing, very, very amazing. So we do have some Q&A, um, a couple from chat and a couple from the q and I'm gonna deal with a couple in chat here just so I don't lose them. So one is you're talking a lot about climate change. So how do you see climate change forecasts, if they come true, affecting aged harvests if they wish to maximize site production over time? Should they consider irrigation, for example, um, because of the climate change forecasts? Right. I, that, that big question with us is how we can keep the force that we have alive, depending on how much climate changes. And that's some of these tools we talked about just by thinning or weed control or kind of shifting it towards the species that are more tolerant. You know, the oak and the pine and the Douglas fir, um, they're all native here and they change in abundance uh, depending on the fire cycle. So if we want to choose the oak and the pine, we can do that. But if you want to keep your precious patch of trees alive, um, it, we're not sure how fast or how much that's going to affect things. I, 
you know, we certainly could look at stopgap measures. Um, irrigation would be rather extreme on a wildland forest setting, but certainly in a yard or a small acreage setting, it's not, especially in terms of establishing small trees. But I think the question was more about keeping uh, existing forests uh, healthy and alive. Um, that aspect of just how fast things are changing, I was, am still surprised at how resilient the forest had been so far. Uh, with the amount of uh, climate heat stress and drought stress that we've seen, Douglas fir is a fairly robust species. I think we're really looking at the shifts in the population of Douglas fir in a lot of our areas, at least over the, you know, the, the next 20 to 30 years. But of course, when you get further out than that, it's really it's really hard to say, uh, but going towards a more drought tolerant or heat resistant species uh, certainly is the longer term uh, measure to take when you start seeing drastic effects like you see in California, for example. All right, got a message from Kerry that we, we were gonna do that um, wrap up poll why we're doing Q&A so that if people need to leave early they can so if you go ahead and put that up Carrie we'll go ahead and do the Q&A and, and for the audience you can move this off to the side if it's like over Glenn's face you can just grab up at the top click and drag it and remember to scroll down and answer all the questions um, so I'm just going to go on with Glenn um, again question from chat you mentioned that there should be a number of dead trees in a healthy forest, depending on the, your, your objectives and that sort of thing. How many is okay and how many is too many? That is a loaded question, but I'll have to say it depends on your objectives. Uh, you know, the, if you look at the kind of the ecological uh, data and the range of what do native forests have, you know, in a young forest, a mature forest, and an old growth forest. You know, we have pretty good numbers on how many dead trees and down logs occurred in these forests that used to develop after a fire and without, you know, before the advent of logging. Um, and those numbers are high. Um, young forests have a lot of dead wood from the previous stand that burned, and then they have the young trees that come up and start dying from competition. And the mid-range of 100 to 150 years would have relatively few because the old wood rotted away and the trees have stopped dying so fast and old growth starts to get decadent. But when you look at your managed forest or what you want, you know, there's some minimum standards. And I think I refer you to some of the wildlife publications. Like I didn't actually have a lot on wildlife in this presentation, but the uh, Woodland Fish and Wildlife websites, and I think a later talk in the tree school webinar would really help get at that. Um, you know, the, there are minimum standards in the forest practices rules for you know two snags per acre and some downwood standards uh, which are you know certainly at the lower end of some of these natural forests but just a few dead trees make a huge difference if you talk to some of the the, the wildlife biologists in, in the amount of bird activity and the and the and some of the legacies around those dead trees so i don't have a hard answer for you i ha would say that you kind of need to look at it from your perspective as well as look at some of the literature more uh, and see what you're comfortable with but All right. especially in the middle of a deep green forest with zero dead trees, adding a few per acre is going to go a long ways to improve wildlife and habitat. Excellent. This just leads right into the next question about dead trees and wildlife. A buck is rubbing its horns on the 10 year old cedar trees. They've debarked the circumference of the trunk. Should I top off the dead part and try to nurse the tree back or let it decay in sight for the insects to come, which will attract the birds, my goal is for a ecologic small forest. Well, I think you answered it with your goal that if you don't have a really good reason to remove that dead tree, then leave it for those purposes. Uh, if it's not a hazard, um, it's always good to have a, a dead tree like that. It's not in the way too much for those purposes of wildlife habitat. And cedar lasts a long time. Um, not as much little ones, but just in general. Okay. This is back to a flat-headed fir borer, which was early in your presentation. Last year, we discovered a flat-headed fir borer infestation in a 65-year-old dug fir, 1,200 feet elevation, southern Willamette Valley. We removed roughly a one-acre patch of the affected trees, its west aspect bench with shallow soil. They're replanting oak and pine. Any recommendations for other actions they should consider? There's only a little bit of forest left on the bench, but they don't want it to spread to the surrounding trees. So with what I've read on the flathead fir borer, the, um, you know, the vulnerability is the, 
the individual tree and the amount of drought stress that it experiences. And it's not so much that healthy trees that are in a better microsite are going to be as vulnerable as they would be with bark beetles. So I don't know if, um, if you know any different, but that there was an excellent publication on the flathead fur borer and the list of sites that I gave you. But my recollection is that we're the flathead fur borer, we're more concerned that um, yes, it's going to take out those most drought stressed trees, but the ones that are still healthy, you know, you save those. Uh, now, certainly when you've got a tree full of flathead borers and the tree's not quite dead and the borers are building in population, it's probably a good idea to reduce that population and remove some of that infested material. But it doesn't take long for that to go away for that tree to die and not no longer host those. So I hope, hope that helps. Excellent. Also, someone suggests from the audience that uh, snags are a resource. And uh, just because you've got a few dead trees doesn't mean you've got a, a bad deal. And that leads to the next question about beetle and blowdown removal. Should we generalize to remove logging slash much smaller diameter as well to reduce beetle outbreak? Will which so to summarize that, will reducing the logging slash reduce beetle outbreaks? Well, it certainly can, but the answer depends on specifics, on the species of tree you're talking about. Uh, so with Douglas fir, for example, it's the larger stems that are the biggest risk, 10 inches and greater, uh, that are a risk for the Douglas fir beetle. And the small slash is not. Uh, for pines, it's kind of the other end of the spectrum. Pines are notorious for small slash, you know, three inches even. Uh, building up beetles that can be hazardous uh, to pines. So, and then there's the timing. So if you have the slash, and, it, and we often recommend with pine especially, and other kinds of slash that are vulnerable or uh, attractive to the beetles, um, do it in the winter. If you can do your pruning and your slash creation, at, you know, in the fall and winter and get it all pretty well cleaned up by summer, then um, it's not nearly as bad as if you put a bunch of fresh slash out in the middle of the beetle flight season. And that's going to vary. You want to look it up for your species of tree, your location. Is there an outbreak now or not? That's a big difference. If it's just sort of endemic levels, that's not such a threat. But if you're in an area like Hood River and the gorge has had outbreaks, kind of rolling outbreaks of uh, five spine ips in, for the last, you know, eight years, it seems like. Um, then there's a much higher hazard and a much more concern about disposing of slash. Um, and piling slash where it's going to stay moist and it's in the shade uh, is one thing. Piling it out in the open where the sun dries it out is different. So there's, there's a lot of pretty detailed recommendations there. And there's a good publication by the Department of Forestry on managing slash specifically. Excellent. Great answer, Glenn. The next question is about the emerald ash borer. Um, what are we doing, the state of Oregon, to prepare for it? Are we giving up or are we trying to uh, detect it or, or what are we doing? We are trying very hard. In fact, we've got a uh, outstanding Oregon pest detector program. You should just maybe Google that. Um, and uh, Wyatt Williams and our, our dear friend and colleague, Amy Grata, who has uh, passed away, were originators of that. And um, so we are keeping an eye out. In fact, we are also keeping a seed bank of uh, the Oregon, native Oregon ash, just in case that emerald ash borer does wipe us out that we preserve the genetics and can bring it back. So uh, I would check out the Oregon pest detector online. All right. I'm just going to keep running. We've got about 20 questions left and uh, we're well, that's why stop. I went fast, Mike. I wanted exactly. no, I to have this. more time for questions. And we really value the questions. And just a word for the audience is we're going to keep going at 4:30. I'll stop and remind you about the next program, but uh, Glenn's okay with going to overtime. So we've set 4.45 as a, as a time that we want to have all these done, and I bet we're going to make it, um, unless you keep asking them. But we, we'll give it our best shot. Um, so this question has to do with armillaria root disease in Douglas fir. Is there any effective treatment? We have an issue with one mature, large, over 20-inch Douglas fir that's showing symptoms of armillaria and they want to know if they could treat it. If it's already showing symptoms, I doubt that there's a treatment that will save that tree. Uh, in fact, to my knowledge, when you have an armillaria root rot problem, um, there's not a lot you can do. Um, I mean, some people would think about, you know, systemic uh, fungicides and things like that, but when it's gone to the level of infecting an area, you really kind of have to look more at the bigger picture of transitioning it. Uh, there's a lot of variability on a site and with the soils and there's trees that 
you know, might make it and others that don't. There's also genetic variability in the virulence of our malaria. So you kind of look at micromanaging what you have, but I don't believe there's a lot you can do to save a tree that's already infected. Good. So this is a long one, but it's an interesting one. Um, our daughter got married under a large big leaf maple tree on our 23 acres in the coast range. We mounded soil around it last summer, moved it away over the winter, remounted again last spring for the late summer wedding. They just pulled the soil away a couple weeks ago as I was worried about the wet soil against the bottom of the bark girdling from rotting bark. I don't know if there's a general concern or not likely. Um, it's a gorgeous, huge tree and we'd hate to lose it. So mounding soil around a big leaf maple, I suppose to make it nice and flat for a, a wedding party. What do you think? Good idea, um, bad idea? I, in general, I think it's good not to change the elevation of soil around mature trees. I know that some tree species are more tolerant than others and I'm not real clear on big leaf maple. Um, but for instance, if that were a Douglas fir, no, no, <laughs> or, it doesn't, or, an oak. or an oak, it doesn't take a lot of soil mounted at the base uh, to harm them. So in the case of maple, you know, trees like coast redwood, for example, are adapted to silt deposits and being buried. And uh, I imagine that cottonwood uh, might be another one, but I have to say, I'd have to research that on the maple. But right. I think in general, it's a good idea not to change the soil elevation around a tree that's got an established uh, root crown. I agree. And the issue really isn't the moist soil rotting the bark and girdling the tree. The issue is oxygen, oxygen in the soil. So if you mound the soil so that the roots are really, really deep under that soil, those roots are not going to get oxygen. Whereas something like a, a redwood, they can send out roots into the new soil. They're adapted for a floodplain. But yeah. I don't know. Big leaf maple is an interesting one. So yeah. Yeah. we'll Good see. I, I would not recommend mounding. Um, Great, great, interesting question. So this is, talks about current recommendations um, and um, maintaining a healthy forest in changing climate. Should we be planning to manage to reduce stand density to offset warm and dry conditions that are forecast? So I did list that as one of the steps we can take. And again, that devil in the details because Yes, when you can keep stand density sort of at a moderate level, it will reduce competition between the trees. Uh, and that can be a pretty big stress on a tree if it's in a highly competitive stand. But at the same time, you're opening up daylight into the understory. Uh, the, the other vegetation can respond and maybe pick up a lot of the resources. So then you might have a maintenance issue with that. So in general, we do think that maintaining lower densities the way that maybe fire used to do in our drier systems is gonna be helpful. And certainly we can show that trees often respond to being managed at lower densities as, as in my thinning examples. But you can, if you wait too long and the trees are overly dense and stressed out and then you do your thinning and you expose them, they can, be shocked by that. Uh, the machine, uh, you know, entries going back and forth, you can have soil compaction or root damage. Uh, if you end up leaving too much flash, you increase your fire hazards. So there's a lot that goes into this idea of reducing stand density. But if you can kind of do it in a gradual and a periodic way and light touch, you know, that would limit the amount of damage and it would certainly limit the shock to trees. Uh, and it's very effective for foresters that do thinning. You know, we have great examples of good effective density management and trees with big healthy crowns that we expect to be more resilient. All right, again, excellent answer. Moving on, in our forest in Southern Oregon, we have lots of incense cedar dying. How do we diagnose the cause? And to throw in another um, thing here, a person says they have incense cedar rust. So talk about incense cedar just dying in Southern Oregon and the, the prevalence of incense cedar rust and what they should do about it. So the first, my first advice is to uh, maybe call Max Bennett or somebody in Southern Oregon uh, and really get the local version of that story uh, or uh, Alicia Christensen or Extension Forester in Roseburg because uh, they're more tuned into that. But I have heard about this. On the one hand, we look at incense cedars maybe being something that might be more uh, you know, of a choice up in the Willamette Valley now because it is native in the Southern Willamette uh, Hills and, and mountains. Uh, but down south, uh, it is actually suffering a lot from stress that I've heard. And I'm not, you know, I think again, it's just like with Douglas fir, 
on a hot dry slope in a mixed uh, pine forest down in southern Oregon you know it might end up being taken out on some of the harsher sites and be left on the more favorable sites. It goes back to looking at each tree and assessing its vigor and its health and some trees uh, may be fading out but others might still be okay. Uh, so check with the locals on that but also on the uh, cedar rust uh, that's something kind of universal that uh, instant cedar gets this kind of pear apple rust that has an alternate host on fruit trees and it's a very difficult thing to control. The general advice is if you if you love your fruit trees, don't have <laughs> incense cedar too close uh, because they, it, they end up getting it. Um, so that's, there's a good fact sheet about that uh, on the, uh, in the OSU um, PNW handbook on disease management. Um, you can look that up, uh, Pacific Northwest uh, uh, disease management handbook uh, on incense cedar and apple pear rust. Good. And my m memory is that it's less of a worry on the cedar. It's right. ugly and messy, but it doesn't tend to kill the cedar, but it's horrible on the pear trees. Right. Yeah. I kind of focused on the alternate host, but yeah. Yeah, it's not seen to be such a damaging agent on the cedar. Good. So you, you mentioned this in, in your talk, but it might be a good chance to uh, refresh us on it. So what are your thoughts that some people are beginning to use seed sources from further south in order to get ahead of shifting climate. Yeah, and that was in that um, discussion where I was somewhat tentative about that uh, assisted migration and looked at the spectrum of uh, science and, and uh, kind of practical options. Um, we are starting to look at that. The geneticists have some ideas, but I'm, I'm kind of waiting to see more clear guidance about it. Uh, in fact, our extension forestry group, we're just now going to start up a new kind of climate science and silviculture um, focus area to try to synthesize what we really think we know and what's reasonable to recommend. Because uh, a lot of folks are not ready to recommend this, too much of this assisted migration. And one of the reasons for that is that the geneticists know that when you take a Douglas fir from a cooler, uh, or excuse me, a warmer, drier um, seed zone, like let's say northern california and you move it up to the oregon coast they have a lot of problems with needle diseases and other issues when they get into a cooler moister climate so the challenge is keeping a southern or lower elevation tree happy uh, in the north or up higher uh, in the next 10 or 20 years uh, even, and then if the climate changes it might be a moving target so we're still um, waiting for guidelines on that is my opinion good um, this is a short one is it beneficial at all to cut off dead branches and limbs of the trees? And I'm thinking in terms of forest health. I know for, for uh, knots and such it is, but how about for forest health? So for forest health, I mean, first there's the fire hazard reduction and changing the ladder fields, the connection of the ground to the crown. That's a good reason to prune. Um, for aesthetics and visuals, it's good, but for forest health, you know, I haven't heard that there's a lot of, as long as the tree itself is healthy and the dead branches are kind of dying in a normal way from shade or, or natural processes, um, large dead branches and stobs sometimes are entrance courts for fungi. Uh, the smaller ones that end up kind of getting, uh, you know, closed out and healed over. The tree, again, has this internal defense mechanism where it mobilizes uh, uh, defensive chemicals around sites where fungi might get in, like around a branch stop. Uh, so usually pruning dead branches is not such a big deal, I don't think, for, for forest health. Um, but now there is a flip side of that. You got to be careful pruning that you don't injure trees. And so you have to do your pruning correctly. And particularly if you're pruning live branches, which is a different question, but you want to be careful pruning live branches. I actually took that slide out of my presentation in the interest of time. But one of the big causes of deformities and uh, chronic pitch moth infection in Douglas fir and pine in the in our area is people pruning uh, in the spring and the pruning wound invites the pitch moth and it can make a pretty ugly chronic uh, infestation at the pruning wound even though you did it reasonably well you didn't prune too close to the tree etc so that's a kind of a word of the wise but I don't think the dead branches are are that big of a deal other than feel or aesthetics or a really big one big dead branch. all right well, Glenn, we're at the end of regulation, so I'd ask you to uh, show the slide again about um, Tiffany's um, webinar next week. I want to say a couple words about that, 
and then um, we'll go back and, and run these questions uh, as long as we can until uh, the end of overtime, which is 445. So next Tuesday, 3 p.m., April 28th, Tiffany Hopkins is going to talk about making shiitake happen. And this is a really popular class at Tree School, and it's going to be really good. Tiffany already has the resources page set up. So if you go to the Know Your Forest um, Tree School online or the Forestry and Natural Resource Extension um, Tree School online, just above Tiffany's picture is the instructor resources. Also, at least on the New Year Forest, and is probably going to come soon on the other, you can register for that. We've got the uh, Zoom registration all set up, so go ahead and register. And, the, and there was a couple of people that asked, now that I'm registered, I can attend all of these, right? And I'm sorry, that's not the way it works, because we have to set up the Zoom room each time. So you need to register each time. So go to the, the New Year Forest page, go to the Tree School online and click to register for Tiffany's and it'll be same time, same place um, next Tuesday. So we'll leave that up um, and Glenn and I will go on with questions. And this next one is about uh, your resources. And you had said that you had a slide about the resources. So I think that you've already shown it. Um, they were interested in the table on historic fire return. Um, was there a resource for that table? You know what I might need to do is go back through my slides and get every link I got in there and put it in that resource document. So that's a that's a dynamic document that I can edit because I don't believe I put that there. Okay. Um, now this is recorded, and uh, if you don't mind, I'll be happy to go back to it if you want to note it. Um, if I can do that, getting closer. There we go. There we uh, go. So it, so a, it is at the bottom there. The bottom. Yeah, it's a long yeah. web link. I didn't shorten it. Um, so leave it up there for a bit, and maybe one of our our assistants in the background can type that into chat, and it will be there. Um, I can't do that while I'm asking Glenn questions, but good idea. Well, I bet good Perry question. could – well, excuse me, go ahead. And you're going to add that to the, the resource page? That would be great. I think a good idea is for me to go through and find ones that I missed that I didn't put in the resource. Okay. So this one has to do with slash disposal. Um, is it better to burn it, let it decay naturally, chip it, or what? Um, they're trying to balance decay, feed the soil, but also be conscious of potential risk to spread beetles and disease. What's your thoughts on this? Thank you, Glenn. You're welcome. Well, I had that question as an ask an expert question. Um, <laughs> So there's a lot of there's, maybe there's they a, didn't like your answer last time. No, there. I just meaning I've thought about that, and um, there's a lot of trade-offs to consider. Um, so, and a lot depends on your objectives. I mean, for fuels reduction, we're really concerned about slash being too much, too high. If you left too much slash and it's knee high walking through an area, I mean that's going to carry a fire and going to be a hazard. Um, in fact, the state forestry folks would knock on your door if they saw that. Um, but then when it comes to the more, you know, nuanced version, um, there's a lot, there's a lot of work on the recycling of, you know, nutrients and carbon and the dead wood that goes back to the earth, uh, leaving the stuff that's smaller than five inches to go back or even three inches, the twigs and the, the needles are really important. Uh, there's a lot of value in kind of if you can just lop it and scatter it out and get it in contact with the ground, that's an, an option. Um, but there's the other hand is it depends a lot on your soil and our soils can be pretty resilient. Uh, if you've got a good soil, with a lot of organic matter, then it may not, you know, be as affected by removing some of that. Um, you know, the fire hazard aspect again comes in there. And then for wildlife, uh, especially the larger slash, um, you know, there's a lot of value to the wood and, and also the decaying wood and the organic matter, it actually retains moisture. So especially some of the larger wood that um, as it decays can be a, a moisture retention zone in the forest soil. We look at, you know, burning big piles is uh, going to make a lot of uh, more, you know, uh, pollution or dirtier smoke um, than a nice hot uh, efficient fire uh, in a smaller pile. Or if you look at um, the option to chip it, you know, so someday we might be interested in biofuel again. Um, and chipping as opposed to burning dirty slash piles is an alternative 
for generating energy and fuel in a cleaner burning uh, way. Um, another aspect of this in my kind of rambling answer is that if you're really interested in wildlife habitat and the wood going back to the earth, but you want to reduce hazards, slash piles are not a bad thing. If you put them kind of in places that they're less objectionable uh, visually, um, a pile is again a safer, uh, you know, it's a fire hazard reduction because it's all piled in one place and it's not con connecting the fuel out into the rest of the, the landscape. Um, and it's also retains moisture and decays over time. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with some scattered slash piles that you let go back to the earth. Um, it's really kind of a, a balance. And I think if we want to kind of reduce burning, there's a lot of options for scattering, chipping, uh, or, or uh, uh, kind of a strategic piling and letting it go back. All right, we've got five minutes left, so I'm gonna go pretty quick here. Any thoughts about historically productive Douglas fir stands transitioning to management for different species, such as Willamette Valley pine and oak? And if owners do want to do that, what's the implications? Or if the stands are doing that, what's the implications? Well, well certainly if you look at Douglas fir productivity, assuming that you, know, that you could still grow Douglas fir on the site, then that's a more productive stand in terms of wood production and biomass production than oak or pine. That's, there's no question about that. Uh, even on the same you know, site, a really relatively good soil, if you had oak and pine, they're not gonna produce as much biomass. But if the, if the climate is changing or the, if that's a marginal site where the Douglas fir is not gonna be healthy, then that's a declining scenario and that's a different story. Um, the hard part is deciding, you know, where are you in that margin? Because I think there's a lot of Doug fir forests in the mid range that might shift, but they could still be a very productive Douglas fir forest. We may over time need to be thinking of changing the uh, genetics a little bit, uh, which again, I think I'm gonna wait and see a little more on that before I make any, you know, recommendations. The other factor of that is what does the Department of Forestry allow? <laughs> and getting acceptance of switching to less productive species. And that should, that's something I think that shouldn't be a problem over time, but there may be somewhat of a bias, uh, not necessarily Department of Forestry, but foresters in general, it's gonna be hard to give up on Douglas fir. Uh, but if we have evidence that it's really not gonna be healthy, then yes, it makes sense to go to uh, you know, pine or oak. And right. those have high habitat values as well, especially the oak um, and maybe the pine someday will be recognized as well. Good deal. One of your slides mentioned forest soils enhancement. Can you provide some examples of forest soil enhancement? Well, one I'm thinking of is maybe ameliorating compaction. Um, so the first thing is try to do no harm, try to protect the forest soil from damage, from compaction, like machines and wet weather that compacts it, um, or um, livestock when a lot of our forest soils that have been converted to pastures and we want to go back to trees, they may have been compacted and we may enhance that by uh, ripping it or, or breaking the compaction. Uh, there's also enhancement with the organic matter, again, with just over time, more going back to the earth, but uh, that's a much slower process. There's, there's nutrient enhancement with fertilizer that has been used effectively once you've ameliorated other soil limitations. Um, that's something that people can do as well, but mostly I'm talking about protecting and reducing damage and maybe breaking up compacted soil. All right. Five more here to deal with, and uh, I apologize if I um, skipped any, but uh, I knew we wouldn't I'm, get through I'm all. I'm glad that we can get so many. That's, I really was looking yeah, forward to this that. Yeah, this is really good, and there's good questions. So how much do dead and drying trees contribute to fire hazard? Should they all be removed, or should some be left for wildlife and returned to the soil? All right, you're, I am not a fire specialist. Um, so or a wildlife fire. I would like to see some of the fire specialists weigh in on it, but the answer is gonna really depend on the context. Um, so if you are a firefighter and you're in an area where fire is spreading and you have a big snag that's likely to catch on fire, um, they have very important reasons for felling a, a snag that's a fire hazard. But if you're in a, a zone especially in our Douglas fir zone in Western Oregon where fire is still pretty infrequent. And the snags are very, not very likely to catch on fire. Uh, so in a lot of our forests, you know, the probability of that snag being a fire fuel hazard is pretty low. And that snag breaks down over time, especially the big ones, uh, makes a big blob kind of an isolated area. Uh, 
Um, so it's really um, uh, very much dependent on the context. And also the same with the down wood. So if the down wood is large and in contact with the ground, um, you know, it retains a lot of moisture. That's different from a lot of slash with air piled up ready to flash. All right, five more questions. And not well, taking any I more think they're questions. adding up. They're keeping I think they are, but, but I'm, I know who the last one is. So I'm just gonna do these. And if you have shorter answers, it would go quicker, I know. I'm sorry. My forest in the coast range was clear cut 20 years ago. The big leaf maples and red alders have sprouted 10 to 20 stems for each. Should I thin them to one to two stems per health over, for optimal health over the next years or leave them alone and let them self thin? Well, if you favor having a well-formed stem and better diameter growth, thinning them is a good idea. Um, they'll thin themselves over the longer term. And with those two, they react differently. Uh, the timing is maybe around that eight to 20 year range. Thinning uh, tends to work. Um, even with maples that they sprout at the base, they've got dominant stems still left that the sprouts don't amount to much. So yeah, you, you, you should thin them. Good, good answer. Um, we have ruts in our stand from logging, which left it difficult to traverse. A previous question discussed oxygen and roots and changing soil depths. What are your thoughts on mechanically leveling the soil so it's uh, more easy to traverse it um, or filling it in with loose soil or should they just leave it alone? Well, I think there's some expertise on uh, rehabilitating old roads and compacted roadways. I would expect that this doesn't take up a huge percentage of your area, I would hope not. And so you're looking at road rehabilitation. Uh, I think there's a lot of choices for uh, fixing that road, getting it, again, breaking up the compaction, adding soil if you need to, trying to restore it to some kind of a functional soil, that would probably be helpful. All right, two more. I just realized we'd already answered one of those. Um, I have a couple of Sitka spruce at home in my landscape in Portland. Um, any suggestions to avoid Swiss needle cast? The Sitka spruce, uh, to my knowledge, does not get Swiss needle cast. It has other problems, maybe, but uh, again, you would apply the principles to diagnose them. Uh, the aphid is one of the more notorious issues with spruce, and it looks a lot like needle cast. It, does. it kills the older needles in many cases. Um, and they shed prematurely. So aphids are probably what you need to watch out for with spruce. Right. Last one. Why do bark beetle populations build up in slash piles or down trees, but they don't build up in standing snags? That's a good question. The kind of the, what I've heard and, and have come up with too is when a tree is a live, healthy, juicy tree and, you, and it's felled by you or a windstorm, uh, and you leave it there, it suddenly is fresh, uh, rich food. And it, especially if there's 10 or 20 of them and the beetles really build up. Standing dead trees often die slower and they dry out and they become, they're not all of a sudden a big pile of fresh food. That's kind of the, the short version that I've heard um, that standing trees, you know, they again, they die slower, maybe from, you know, from the top down and it's not a whole bunch of food all at once. And, I would guess though that a concentration of standing dead trees that were quickly killed like by fire, that's a different story. Fire killed trees sometimes can spread, can be similar to um, down wood from my understanding. I don't know, Mike, do you have anything on that? I don't, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, but I'm betting we're gonna have a, one of our webinars will cover something like that. So I would just encourage you to, to dial back in um, down the road and I, unfortunately, we have to cut it off here, but I think we got most of the questions answered and I think Glenn did a great job. Thank you so much. It's not easy being the first one out of the box on a new venture. Um, just wanted to let you all know that we had over 200 people today. Um, we had a little about 300 register, but 200 of you showed up and this exceeded our wildest dreams because if you gave this at tree school, Glenn, how many people would have seen your presentation? 35? Yeah, 35 or 40. Um, yeah. yeah, so got 5x. That's not a bad day. So thank you all. Tune in next week. Um, visit the, the resource page and uh, it has all of Glenn's contact information. And again, this webinar is going to be saved as a YouTube video and it will be available to link from both the Know Your Forest Tree School Online page and the OSU Extension Tree School Online page. So Thanks a lot, and uh, we're out of here. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I hope it was useful.
come back again to the next one.